guys just up top i just want to give you all such a huge thank you for the amount of amazing support and feedback we got on the first podcast episode we were a bit nervous about recording and even publishing it to begin with um so the fact that you guys have left so many positive comments sent me so many amazing messages has made both todd and i feel really good about continuing this podcast and being a bit more confident about our work and the the content that we're putting out for you um so thank you so much for that we really appreciate your support um also the book is still in the reviewing stages of publication it will be out very soon but i will keep you updated in the coming podcast episodes and across social media so just keep an ear and an eye to the ground for that one but until then here is a sneak preview of chapter two the art of talking to a conservationist let's dive right in Hello again and welcome to the second episode of How to Conserve a Conservationist, the podcast with Jesse and Todd. We're up to the second chapter. Last episode, I I kept calling the chapters episodes and it was very confusing to know if I was talking about... Well, we're doing a podcast episode for every chapter, so they are interchangeable. (laughs) This one is chapter and episode two, how to know the art of talking to a conservationist. Well, I guess it could be how to talk to a conservationist. Basically, that was some good <laughs> inter-sentence editing. I know. Made it sound better. <laughs> well, basically, um, through my journey of being a conservationist, I have realized that there's some things you just shouldn't say to us. Like, I, I wonder if you're listening to the last episode and were thinking, "God, everything Todd said, like, don't say that to me. It's triggering." <laughs> like, so today I want to talk about what you should and shouldn't say to a conservationist and some of the things uh, I mentioned in the book I'll expand on a bit more and other things I guess new well not too much we don't want to still want you to buy the book yeah okay so we'll keep some secrets between us but I guess like what got me onto this whole language journey was recently well not really recently a couple of months ago I did a interview with the ABC on the the Nightline project project program so it was like a 10 p.m interview and it was really quick I didn't know how quick it was going to be and the last question threw me, just completely threw me. I was like, what can we expect for the future of lonely conservationists? And that seems, there seems normal. Like there's a question everyone asks, but I basically said, um, it's hard for me as one person to change s- systemic issues. Like it's only me working on it. Like it's hard for me to just fix all of our problems. Um, and she just basically cut off the interview before I had a chance to say like what I was actually trying to do to work on it and it got me thinking about like how if you ask what the future of a project is it kind of means that like what you're doing isn't enough and that's kind of pressuring for people that spend every waking hour trying to do things like just to be fair there were actual other projects and things you were going to plan to do in the future you just you took it as where you taking this entire idea further it has to progress when you're still you know in the midst of making it an idea to begin with when do you tell people about things because like i feel like a lot of people have secrecy when it comes to like this was before i started lonely conversationist the web series and i wasn't sure whether it's something like i should announce publicly on a radio show in case like I just didn't do it for whatever reason. <laughs> well, that's ex- that's exactly the kind of scoop that a radio broadcast is looking for, I guess. Yeah, well, I don't know when you should tell people about things. Like, I, I didn't really tell anybody about this podcast on the off chance that we just were really bad at podcasts and it never went ahead, which, I mean, like, we almost were too lazy to record it, so, like, that's fair. Um, but I guess, like, for me in conservation, the really important stuff is, like, monitoring and the unsexy work. Like, I really hate when people will give you a bunch of money to do a brand new project because it's new and exciting, but there's no money given to organizations who need the funds to upkeep their existing projects. And I think the a big part of sustainability is, is just upkeep and maintenance and monitoring. So it kind of bothers me when people are like, what is the future? What is the exciting new step? Like, why isn't just maintaining what we're doing in a really great way? Why isn't that enough? As a non-conservationist, can I initiate the idea that this isn't just a conservationist problem. This is a problem for a lot of people in different industries. Do you face this in your work? Well, in IT, it's always about the new shiny toy. You know, oh, I've got the newest, the, the 2019 version of the software now. It's way better than the 2018 version. 
make sure you just redo the entire thing in the new version. Like, well, why? The old one's for what? Do you wish that people put more time and effort into maintaining software and to, like, keep improving things that already exist instead of releasing flashy new ones every year? It's well, in, in software in particular, it's a very weird balance because software is a bit of an abstract concept to begin with. So there's value in making something like you make Windows 95 and that's like done forever. But nowadays you got Windows 10 and there's like a new version of Windows 10 every six months and your computer does this massive update. So you can't just say like, here's Windows 10, it's finished. They're constantly changing it and working on it, which sounds great. But now that means there's never going to be a Windows 11 and there's never going to be like, they can't just stop and say, oh, let's read think about how we're doing things mm, so they just al- stuck down this train now almost you wish that they did focus on like starting and stopping of new projects because that, that i guess that makes more sense for the software world it's about yeah finishing one project before going on to the next mm. and not just stretching it out into one gigantic project but i guess that kind of applies to conservation as well where like a lot of projects just don't get finished because the funding dries up or whatever or well, i imagine it's normally like do this and then a year later you're still doing project a and they're like can you just do project b as well and before you know it you're just doing 10 projects at once and still getting paid for like and getting paid a. the same yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it sucks and i think like the next time somebody interviewed me for a podcast and they sent me a list of questions and it was like what's the future of lonely conservationists and i really i talked to them about how i felt uncomfortable about that question because i prefer if people ask like what's the future what do you hope the future for conservationists would be because that kind of lets me answer it in a way that's not like the onus isn't on me it's like what do i hope for conservationists and maybe we can all contribute if we all like the idea instead of like what are you personally doing to solve this systemic issue do you think it is a much more conservation problem of like if you spend years trying to save the elephants and you know you personally have done a lot of work and effort into it and you're really proud of that work but you know the world keeps turning around you and the elephants are less and like do you take that as a personal failure you sort of can't help but do that Mm, i think it's interesting because like when i was a teenager and younger um i believe truly that i was the only person responsible for saving the world i think like this comes back to the glamorization thing of like just not knowing other conservationists existed because i grew up before social media where you could see like 500 other conservationist accounts it was just me at my school and i was the only one who had these values so i was like crap it's on me i have to save everything like that's a lot of pressure for a kid but I, I wrote a note in my phone in my old brick Nokia when I was in like old enough to have a phone like year nine. It was like, world, I promise I'll save you eventually. Just like let me grow up enough so I can muster the knowledge and the time to do it. And like I literally thought it was a, a problem that I had to save on my own. And I think like there are some species like an obscure nematode or something that like there might be one scientist in the world working on it, like literally falls on them. But I guess like this is my problem with feeding ducks <laughs> is that like i know it's bad to feed ducks they get like a lot of wing deformities and they like basically if you if you feed ducks you're killing ducks but i feel feeding ducks bread i think you mean feeding ducks bread yeah if you feed them grapes or like something that's actually in their diet little bugs it's fine but if you feed ducks bread it's really bad for them it can cause a lot of issues and spread diseases in the pond um but every time i see somebody feeding a duck bread I, as an educator and a conservationist, feel like by not talking to the people that I'm actually killing the ducks myself. And I talk about this in the book in a different chapter, but like, I think this is something that a lot of conservationists face because I've talked about it with a lot of people where like my role as an educator, I feel is to tell people like, hey, you're killing a duck. That's very confrontational. Like people don't like to be told, hey, you're killing a duck. Rarely do I have grapes on me when I go for my walk to be like, sorry, the, your bread is actually killing the ducks. Feel free to feed them, but take these grapes. So I feel like unless I have like a constructive alternative, I can't have that communication with these people. Is it almost like when a vegan tells you what to eat? People take it very personally. Mm, but, yeah. but I think what, what a person eats in their life is a bit of a personal thing. But if you just feed the ducks because you're bored... Well, I can't you tell. might care about the ducks and want to know that the bread is poisonous. I can't tell if people are feeding ducks because they like ducks or because it's a selfish thing. 
And like actually the other day I saw a family, well this was way before quarantine, so it wasn't really the other day, it was like the start of the year when it was legal. Um, I saw this family and they had a clearly disabled child and they were feeding the ducks bread and I was like tossing up in my head, what if this is like the happiest day of this child's week? What if it's like... Uh, You're not about to just what ruin if, the day of yeah, a like, disabled child. Like, what if this child, like, this is his favorite activity? And what if they can't do much else? But this is something that they can engage in. But it's at the cost of the duck's life. And, like, it's, it's hard because in all these situations, I end up not having this conversation with people because there's so many times that we've talked to actual people who are like educated in conservation matters and they have still chosen um unethical decisions like remember when we were in book at lawang and there was this woman that rode an elephant and she was like oh jesse like why didn't you ride the elephants and i was like oh it's really harmful and detrimental to the elephants um and then she was just making up all these excuses to allow her to ride it like oh they're aggressive like we should be riding them and in my head i'm like well if they're aggressive why are you getting on its back you know yeah, I don't think she thought it through. You, I had no idea because a lot of people will go on a holiday and like ride on the back of an elephant. It seems like a touristy thing to do. And then you told me one day it like it fucks up their backs. Mm. So you maybe shouldn't do that. And now I very happily tell people that like, oh, I went to Bali and I read an elephant. I'm like, yeah, you fucking idiot. You <laughs> probably gave them carpal tunnel syndrome and they're fine, you twat. Yeah. I'm very happy to confront people like that. Well, it's easier for you because you are not in, you can't be labeled as like a greenie or a hippie. Like as soon as, like you think being a... If I tell people not to ride elephants, it's a bit greeny. Well, like for instance, like... Totally. But then riding elephants is a bit of like, you have to be a bit of a greeny person to even want to do that in the first place. Well, is that the catch-22? Look, I don't like the term animal lover. If people use the term animal lover, I'm like, I don't respect you. I'm sorry if this offends anybody. But I feel like if I picture the term animal lover, it's people who like smother their cats instead of like actually respecting animals. So I feel like it's those in brackets animal lover kind of people that go and ride elephants and i feel like if i say for instance i was on a plane and somebody got on the plane late and they're like oh, i'm i'm so sorry i missed my flight they were just talking to the person next to them uh, i just came back from bali oh yeah what did you do all oh, the traditional stuff like um i took got a photo with an orangutan i held a baby in orangutan like and for those of you who don't know my background is like when i was five years old i asked my mom how do i save the orangutans and at 24 I was in an Indonesian forest working with some of the top orangutan conservationists studying them. So for me, like that's a a big passion of mine. And I was really arguing myself with myself, like, is it my role as like a primatologist to tell her like, why, why you should not do that? Like maybe I could prevent her from uploading the photo, from inspiring her friends to do it. But then like I'm stuck on this plane with her and I don't want it to get hostile because the plane hadn't even left the ground yet. And it's like just so hard from a conservationist perspective, like how do you educate people but not getting hostile? But I feel like you as a, a normie can have these conversations and it's like oh, you know how to do it in a good way. Whereas people could be like, oh, you're a hippie or a greenie or like I feel like the more you know, the more stigma you have on you to be able to have these conversations. It's... As long as you don't do it from a preachy point of view, like I'm better than you because I, you know, really, you say you're an animal lover, but you don't really love them. I really love them. As long as you don't have that attitude and you just, it's going to be a bad experience no matter what, because they're going to have this cherished memory or like, you know, this, this habit that they have and you're going to tell them, actually, that's not the best idea to do. And this thing that's really special maybe to you in your life is a, a negative experience now. Yeah you're just going to have a guilt and regret about it yeah it's hard because like (sighs) so that's just conservationists talking to people what about people talking to conservationists yeah how do they mess that up well okay this is basically everything we just talked about was in a completely different chapter we can get back to that in later (laughs) episodes but this chapter is mainly about how what people say to conservationists that kind of rub us the wrong way and for me a big one is like when i'm down about something like i'm not getting paid for work i'm really burnt out i have major imposter syndrome things just aren't working out for me and when people like oh don't be sad things always work out for you jesse and i'm like okay i've been 
like not earning anything. I'm 27 years old. I can't pay the rent. You have a full time job. Your life is together. How can you tell me that things always work out for me? Like they I think don't. <laughs> anyone saying that is a bit of an empty platitude. Oh, anyway, it, it just makes me so mad because it makes me feel like I'm being ungrateful for complaining about things in my life when it's not my fault that my industry is so glorified. Like just because you see David Attenborough and all like the big phases, Steve Irwin and everybody that's so like glamorized on TV, it doesn't mean that we don't have problems and also it doesn't mean that like we should feel guilty for talking about them yeah yeah <laughs> i just it could be hard for people to to relate though so you 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 just come back from a big trip and you're really exhausted and you like it's just almost culture shock going from like the middle of a forest to you know a pub and you just chat in with a friend that you haven't seen and they're like, oh, wow, so that, you know, that's, that must have been incredible. I'm so jealous that you got to do that. And you in that moment will be like, well, it's fucking, it was rough, like it was hard. It was Even hard work a step to do. back, I hate when people say, how was your trip when I was working for six months? They like, will think you're on a holiday. How do I sum up six months of life? Like nobody ever asks you, like it's, you haven't seen a friend since, it's July and you haven't seen a friend since January and they're like, oh, how was your half a year? How do you sum up half a year? Like how? how often you see your friends. I'm often telling people about my half a year. <laughs> but it just is like, how do you sum up six months of living in a foreign country? And I talk about some lonely conservationists. Um, I talk about this with them a lot because a lot of us come back from these experiences where it's like equally amazing, life changing as it is like traumatic. I think I talk about this a lot in the mental health chapter. But when I came back from Indonesia, it was, I think... I was pretty messed up. I was not dealing with it well coming back because it was like very harsh to live over there as a, a white woman. Um, I was having builders in my bed thinking I was a prostitute, kids lighting fires on my porch. I lived across from a mosque. I was always living in fear of living with Todd unmarried and also like when Todd wasn't around of just my own life. Um, so for be living in fear for six months and coming back, we found out afterwards that we actually lived in a very rough neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, we didn't know that at the time. We assumed that people just lie for eyes on porches <laughs> normally. like, basically, before I lived in Madan, this is, like, um, a city in, in uh, North Sumatra. Before I lived there, I actually lived in the forest for a month. That was amazing. Had a great time. Even, like, it was petrifying because I was living with uh, a whole bunch of men who I didn't understand a word of them, but, like, once we'd worked out how each other speaks and because we spent every day every second of the day together like trekking through the forest you instantly like you have to work out a language to communicate with you're eating you just together. develop a complicated series of nods <laughs> well basically like i end up having to learn um bahasa but learning it from a bunch of indonesian men in the field uh, i ended up learning a very crass version of bahasa so when i lived in the city the next year it was like a language so shock and a culture shock because it wasn't as chill like living across from a mosque in a city is very dis different from laughing about bananas in the forest so yeah Why are bananas funny um because they always ask me like jesse how do you like our bananas i'm like oh they're much bigger in australia and that's just funny um just some Classic shit talking in the forest. The sexual innuendo. I would never have that conversation in Madame. Um, because they just were heckling me because I, my forearms were out of my t shirt. So I was already sexual. That's already too, I, too outrageous, too what, much sexual innuendo. What was weird is I was getting like, Jesse, I can see some of your legs. How, why did you shave them? That's so sexual. Like, you get in trouble in Australia, the like gender norms. Oh, your legs are too hairy. Then I go over to Indonesia. Oh, your legs are too shaved. Like, what do you want from me, man? <laughs> can't win, can you? can't he? win. <laughs> um, but basically, it's like, after six months of dealing with that, and then coming home and people expecting it to be, um, like, the most amazing time of your life, and kind of, like, you can't complain because you get these opportunities. And it's like, well, it's hard work. I was completing my honours degree. My supervisor was horrible i was crying every time i got emails and in fact like i was afraid to open emails for like three years after that supervisor every time i got an email even to this day when anybody like wants to talk to me i think it's bad news i think i'm gonna be fired i think like the worst case scenario um it's taking me a long time to not be afraid of emails so even just from the email perspective like it was rough <laughs> 
What about when, uh, I, more broadly, people talk to you about, you know, what you're doing, what your work is? Because most people's lives, you know, you go to school, go to uni, go to a trade, then you're like, okay, now I'm an accountant, and I got an accountant job at this firm, maybe a couple of years I'll get a promotion to this position, and like, you know, they sort of map out their life in terms of what job they have, and then they will talk to you, and they'll say, so what? What's what's your job when you get job? No, it's okay. This happened to me last year. So what Lonely Conservationist had just been taken off and I was like, I went to the city for a meeting. Um, I was dressed all nice because I was meeting professionals and I was coming back. Basically, I caught the wrong train and ended up at the wrong stop and it was like um, a couple of stops away from where I need to go but if I like went if I wanted to go home by the train system I'd have to catch a train it would be like two hours like I'd have to go back through the city I ended up just catching an uber I guess this was like too much information but the point is I was in an uber but I was look I looked professional because I had just been in a meeting and I was so petrified because I thought he was going to ask me what I did for a living or like what I seems like a reasonable small talk Basically, he ended up asking me, and I felt like I had to justify my life story because I was like, "Oh, um, I'm, 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 I'm running a, a, a community of conservationists, but like, I don't get paid, but I'm doing this. Like, it's not a job, but it's what I spend 40 hours a week doing." But then, so there's that side of it where it like stresses me out because I don't have a business card that's like, "Jesse, you do this and you get paid for this." Like, I never know if I'm actually what I am doing but then the, the flip side of it is I was over my friend's house and her stepmom's like Jesse what do you do and at the time um, before COVID I was a sustainability teacher where I led excursions in like um, forests and marine parks and she's like oh yeah Jesse what do you do and I was like oh I'm, I'm a teacher I'm an educator and then my friend was like no you're not you lead a global community of conservationists. Don't palm yourself off as an educator. But in my brain, I finally had an answer to give. I was like, I get paid to do this work. And then she's like, no, 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 you're a global, um, like you're a leader of a global community. Like you're a community organizer. And so like, I never know how to say what I do. And it is frustrating. But then like, so since leading this um, web series, Lonely Conversationists, um, it's interesting because there's not a lot of conservation psychologists in the world. And when I use the term conservation psychologist, I don't mean what conservation psychology actually is, because I think it really is how people interact with the environment. What I actually mean is people who study the psychology of conservationists. Like there's maybe like five to 10 of these people in the world. So it's interesting talking to them and them thinking like, I'm not good enough, but then also realizing they're probably the one of the only few people in the space and they have to own the space. So now I've kind of learned that I'm one of the only few people working in this space. And even if I'm not getting paid, I have to just own this space because I guess it's expected of me, but also there's no other representation in here. I don't know. That's a very long winded answer, but it's like turmoil for me. If anybody asks me what I do, I just freak out a bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an easy job. Like if you say you're a lawyer, people can just know what that is pretty easily. But even then, you can say you're a conservationist and people are like, oh yeah, and they might want to know more. But if you say you're a lawyer and you have to go into like, oh, oh, so like you defend criminals. No, no, actually I do like the back end uh, working out the files for this uh, currently working on a constitutional uh, case that's a civil case. People like, if you get into the details, people quickly stop caring. Yeah, I know that for, if I tell people I work in IT, they like immediately don't care about any details. Like, yeah. oh yeah, computers, yeah, cool. You know when you said conservationists, in the last episode you said conservationists are going out into the forest and patting animals on the head. Yeah, so and if I- you tell people you're a conservationist, they were like, oh, so which very cuddly <laughs> ca- animal do you pat? No, but when you say you work in IT, I imagine the school IT guy, you know, in primary school when like the teacher's having trouble with the rolling in TV and they're like, oh, it's the, it's the snow, it's the compu- like the black and like fuzzy computer screen we have to call it that's what i imagine every it guy to be even though i know i that mean that's not wrong there's nothing to do with what you do but i always imagine the primary school it guy from years of my life being like go to call it you oh your email's not working better go to it don't know your kid picks password it <laughs> yeah that's what it is but i think like it's, it's kind of like i always grapple with if i explain what i do to people 
is that enabling more people to understand the life of a conservationist or is it just like they didn't care and they're zoning out i think if 99 percent of people asking you this they was they're looking for small talk and then you just go in this internal turmoil about what who am i what do i do <laughs> yeah and i think like a lot of people so we did a lonely conversationist episode about people who come from other backgrounds like um my friend Gus did international relations and Maria, they're both um, lonely conservationists. She did uh, neuroscience, Neuro- yeah, neuroscience, brain, brain science. <laughs> um, and like for them being able to own the identity of a conservationist or if they tell people they're conservationists and people are like, no, you're not, that's really traumatic because like conservationists put in a lot of time and effort into what they're doing. So for people to knock that title from them that's really not a good thing i would definitely recommend not doing that (laughs) um another thing is oh yeah this is a story i mentioned in the book but um if you read the book you can find out more information but i was basically being chased by a tiger and i get home um to my hut in malaysia and i go on my family chat and i was like to my family oh my god i just spent the morning running from a tiger um, oh, I survived. I didn't even eat breakfast today. And then my dad was basically like, "Oh, that's that's nice, sweetie. Um, Dom, that's my brother's name. Um, how's your football going?" And I was yeah. like, "What the hell? Like, I have just well, you've run got your little story from a family of tigers. What is the rest of the family? <laughs> well, how's their day being?" And I don't know if it's because people don't understand like that I'm telling the truth because it's weird to have people come up to you and say you ran from a tiger in the morning I get it's weird it's it's totally weird but I'm I've almost died from like a tiger incident and the orangutan incident I can tell the orangutan story because I do and put that in the book um basically I was doing my honors in Indonesia this was the first month I was talking about when I went away and was just living in the forest and we were basically tracking orangutans every day it was really early on when we were there and we went out with the field staff who were all men, as I said, but at that point there was another PhD student who had come with me for the first week and she was also a woman. Um, and I think the field staff started showing off. So there was a great um, big mother orangutan and she had a little baby and they started kiss squeaking back at her. And I don't think this is like the same vein as you shouldn't touch animals and pat them on the head. You shouldn't like in- verbally interact with them either. Cause basically like, do the conservationists follow the Star Trek mantra <laughs> of not interfering? Don't don't interfere. Like especially when I was working with vervet monkeys in South Africa, they raise your eyebrow their eyebrows at you when they like want to start some shit, and it's so so hard not to raise your eyebrows back at them. But if you do, you're accepting their challenge. So just don't anybody like you have to be so careful with primates. They're so intelligent. You can't use any antagonistic body language. But <laughs> Basically, my field staff were kiss squeaking back, trying to show off. And she grabs this tree, the orangutan, grabs a tree, rips it out of the ground by moving it back and forth, back and forth. And then she just chucks this whole tree in our direction. I'm running for my life, thinking, like, the thing I've spent my whole life trying to save is going to be the thing that ends me. While I'm running, I get my foot stuck in two trees that are really close together, and I fall to the ground. And I'm like, this is it. I am dead. I'm saying all the things in my head, my life slows down. I'm thinking of things that I wish I said to my friends and my family. I never did. This is it. This is my last moment. And I finally yank my foot out and I dive over the other side and I hear the thud and it's like not on me. And I was like, thank God. Like I almost got killed by this orangutan. Luckily as I was out in the middle of the forest, like I had no reception. There's no reception at the pondock, the cabin. Like I bet you should have messaged your family this. Oh, that's nice, honey. I couldn't have told them anyway, but I learnt after the first time like actually because the 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 tiger incident and the orangutan incident happened on the same trip because i spent a week in malaysia and then i went to indonesia afterwards to stay for that month so basically like it was a tiger and then an orangutan tried to kill me in this in the space of like two months um and so at that time i just didn't tell my family because I couldn't well firstly i couldn't but even if i could i wouldn't have because i don't want that that's nice dear uh, Dom, how's your football? <laughs> so don't tell conservationists that's nice, dear, when they have a life or death situation. Like, don't trivialise their life or death situations because although it seems fantastical, like, it's real. I could have died. <laughs> and that's like, 
Um, something I got my friend to proofread my book, and there's a part where I'm talking about how like you're lying in your hut in Africa with like some illness, thinking you're gonna die, and thinking of like all the things you wish you said to the people in your life. And she's like, "That's too real, Jesse. I've been there as well." And I think like there's, I know conservation looks different to a lot of people, but to um, the people that are fortunate enough to travel to work, it's like there's a lot of illness. Uh, sickness injuries like I even got snared in a snake trap like there's a lot of things that can happen to you because you're often working in very remote or um, developing countries and I just think that it's uh, what we do shouldn't be glamorized or trivialized like it shouldn't be blown up to be bigger than it is and it also shouldn't be like oh whatever like you almost died from a tiger like just just respect us when we talk about almost dying like it makes us feel like you don't love us <laughs> um so i guess like you were there when i got snared and it's interesting because like todd was at the indonesian like the cabin they call it a pond dog and i was out on my field surveys and he was basically there to teach people to fly drones because he didn't he didn't come out in the field surveys with me uh every time just once <laughs> and, Can i point out walking in like forests for six hours is a rough and i chose not to do it it's, it's not his forte so you admit conservation is rough <laughs> yeah todd was complaining there was no wi-fi and no chairs to sit on so he has a very base like a very low bar for what rough is in the first place <laughs> no chairs just bring up a little camping chair yeah. how hard is it you have to take it with just you. a little stool just something to sit my ass on I can't just sit on the ground forever. <laughs> just sit on the ground, Tom. It will make you more flexible. But basically, I got caught in this snare because basically, like, my field staff are so small. I'm six foot, and my field staff are little small Indonesian men walking through the forest at lightning speed. I'm getting, like, clotheslined on every vine and tree. So I'm being really careful and slow. Obviously, not careful enough because I'm not looking at the ground. I'm trying to keep up with them. And I get caught in a snake trap and I hear a pop. And my whole ankle, like, I'm on the ground. I'm just pop and on the ground. Anyway, I had to get back two kilometers to the pond dock. And there's like, they can't carry me. Like, so I just hobbled my way back. But adrenaline got me there. You know when you, like, bung your ankle and it's, like, kind of fine. Because adrenaline gets you out of your situation. But as soon as you rest, then it's, like, horrible. Well, that's a lot of injuries. Yeah, like basically anything. While you're on adrenaline, it's fine. Like I've heard people have dr dr driven home, driven home with a snap tendon. Like I think as long as it just happens, you're invincible for a period of time. I'm surprised you got so much adrenaline from just stepping on a <laughs> snare. Well, yeah. I've been hit by cars like riding a bicycle. And when and he says that, he means he rode his bicycle into stationary cars. <laughs> and vice versa. I was stationary and a guy hit me. <laughs> But like that, that's a bit of a shock to the system, and like there is a bit of adrenaline. Well, I had to get myself two k's out of a forest with the. We don't know if because basically Indonesian hospitals, that well anyone everyone just told me to get a massage, and I was not about to massage a sore well, tendon. Well, you, you came back and you were like, ah, ah, my ankle. I'm like, whoa, too bad we're in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone reception because <laughs> it'd be really great to have some ice to put in your ankle. And everyone there was like, oh, if you want ice, we can just go get ice. That's not a problem. Just wouldn't think to do that. I'm like, yeah. What? <laughs> so basically, we don't know if all the tendon was snapped or like what damage, but it's still messed up to this day. So thank you, Indonesia, for that. Um, but basically, like Todd didn't really believe me that it was that bad at the beginning. It wasn't until like... Well, you did walk for hours <laughs> on it. So, <laughs> But then there was a point where it was like so swollen and i was in so much pain and if you know anything about indonesia is squatting toilets and like <laughs> firstly it was too painful to walk myself down because it was like the pondok had like this slopey bit of soil to the like where the toilet was um firstly getting down there was kind of impossible he had to help me secondly like i had to spend the rest of my month like squatting on a really painful ankle like the one leg squat situation um, so even just like the fact that Todd was there and, and kind of trivialized my injury or well, like, yeah, it's just hard when people, I don't know, they don't understand the gravity of what, of what your bad situation is, even if they're there. Like, I just, it's tough, man. 
I remember the, when we got back to our house in Madan. Yeah, I think you're just mad that... I was making you pasta. You ended up making dinner I was with there a with a ankle. chair. I was like sitting at the kitchen on a chair making pasta and Todd was up in the air-conditioned room doing whatever he was doing. So I'm a bit salty about that. That's not really language. That's like body language. Like, just you don't make me make the pasta. I didn't realize you were so hungry and desperate for pasta that you were going to make it yourself. This is like the one fact about me. This is like the biggest communication thing in uh, Madagascar. Like somebody legitimately introduced me once. They're like, hi, um, this is Jessie. Uh, the one thing you need to know about her is if she is angry, give her a biscuit. <laughs> you do not want to see her hungry. And then it was on the wall. Like we had this wall of like advice. <laughs> and um, one of the pieces of advice was like if she's angry give her a biscuit but a guy from the Netherlands wrote it so it was like guy for a biscuit which was kind of cute um, so the biggest communication thing with me is like I am hangry and you do need to accommodate for that especially when I have maybe a rip tendon something wrong with my ankle especially if I've been snared like the, I saw camera trap footages camera trap footages that sounds bad I saw Footage from a camera chart when I returned to the office the next week of an elephant with no foot because it had been snared. Like, I could have had no foot. That is incredible. Your foot is more tough than an elephant. Well, this was like a snake trap. Like, I don't know what trap the, the elephant, elephant trap. stepped in, but I feel like I saved a snake that day, sacrificed myself. Yeah, there's a snake slithering around <laughs> that wasn't caught. And this is something I kind of regret not putting in the book was... That wall in Madagascar, this is something that haunts me to this day. On the wall, they wrote in big blue letters, be better. Like that was the camp mantra, be better. And I think from their perspective, it was like, you should always strive to do more as like a positive thing. But for me, it was like, whatever I did, it wasn't good enough. I was the only one there that was really serious about publishing my research and taking my research seriously for a bit. Um, and I was always giving lectures to the volunteers like this was not in my job description but I was like really interested in biogeography and sharing that information and I felt like I went above and beyond in my job role but there was always glaring blue letters like huge letters the size of a shed just be better <laughs> and that really rubbed me the wrong way like I just felt like I could never be good enough if I could always have well, the pressure to be better it was a bit of a strange situation where most of the people there were paying to be there yeah so i, th I was did too. a lot of them think of it as a holiday no like because normally you pay to be in a tropical island as a holiday and now there there's you know conservationists as well so they need to like really drill into these people like please take it a little bit seriously oh it's challenging because like i was also paying to be there but like less because i was a staff I had so much You get the benefit of a 10% discount if you <laughs> do the owner's jobs. Yeah, like, so there was, like, my level, which was uh, assistant research officer, and then there was, like, principal investigators, and then there was, like, the camp manager, like, the big boss. So there was, I was, like, the, the lowest rung of the staff, but I was still paying to be there. And it was kind of hard because, like, the volunteers were my age and older than me, and they were all there as a volunteer, no responsibility. And I was like, not allowed to be friends with them. And like, just had to be the most professional person when everybody else that was my age was like, just allowed to have fun. But I don't think it was, the be better was just like, I don't know, it was so hypocritical because nobody was being better. Like everything that was a rule, people were breaking it. The only rule people followed was like giving me biscuits because I got so fat because every day there was like packets of biscuits left in my hut from when somebody had thought that I like they pissed me off. They just leave a packet of biscuits. <laughs> but it's like, I don't know. So sometimes there's, there's too many biscuits. Like I think on my waistline, <laughs> I know I'm walking every day, but if you're only eating rice, beans, beer and biscuits, it's like doesn't do you any favors. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I think these are all obviously there's more but I feel like these are just things that we can stop doing like maybe just think about the person and I guess like if the industry is so glorified it's hard to it's hard to acknowledge that yes they might be going through it yes they might have just been snared or got killed by an orangutan or being crying alone in your hut 
So like, but it probably wasn't a fun holiday to ask them about. Yeah. So stop assuming that we have fun holidays as conservationists. We're probably working for free, paying to work, getting snared. Like it's not a fun time. Like, don't get me wrong. Those trips have given me some of the best memories of my life. Like I got to kick the ocean and see a bioluminescence. Um, I got to like win awards at conferences and and speak amongst like my idols in the industry. But I think it's just we we need to think more about what we say to people. And this probably just doesn't apply to conservationists. It applies to everyone. Like just think before you speak. So that was episode and chapter two of How to Conserve Conservationists, The Art of Talking to a Conservationist. And yes, yes, I totally know. I hogged a lot of that conversation because it's something I'm really passionate about. And I promise you, I just, I I promise that Todd will be more represented in the next episode because episode three is all about imposter syndrome. And it's something that I think everybody battles with. So I'm really interested to hear his opinion then. But until then, you can hear other voices that aren't ours on the blog site, which is lonelyconservationist.com. You can see more of the community on social media at Lonely Conservationist on Instagram and Lonely Conserve on Twitter. You can also support us if you want to on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash lonelyconservationist. And I look forward to the next episode all about imposter syndrome next week. Catch you then. Thank you.